Welcome to the last month at the Federal Circuit, a look at recent Federal Circuit decisions impacting the intellectual property community. Finnegan partner Mike Jakes joins us now to offer insight into recently decided cases and their potential implications. Mike is currently the leader of Finnegan's appellate practice. He's appeared in over 100 appeals at the Federal Circuit and argued nearly 50 times. Now, Mike, the Federal Circuit recently answered some questions that had been left open by the Supreme Court in other Federal Circuit decisions. One of those cases was Cell Spin Soft versus Fitbit. Tell us about the case. The plaintiff in that case, Selspinsoft, owns several patents that make it easier to publish digital images or video from a camera directly to a website. According to the patents, there were prior art devices that could digitally capture images, video, or other types of content. But to upload that content on the internet, the user had to transfer a file containing the content onto a computer using a cable or a memory stick. So Cellspin's patents taught a way to upload the digital content automatically. And that you have an application on the mobile device, such as a smartphone, that detects and receives the content from the data capture device, as it was called, such as a video camera, and then the application publishes the content on the website automatically. Cellspin filed more than a dozen patent infringement cases against Fitbit, GoPro, Garmin, and several other companies in the Northern District of California. What happened in the district court in that case? As often happens in these cases, the defendant filed a joint motion to dismiss the complaints under Rule 12b-6 on the ground that the patents were ineligible under Section 101. The district court agreed and dismissed the complaints, the court found that Selspin's patent claims were directed to the abstract idea of acquiring, transferring, and publishing data and multimedia content on one or more websites. The court explained that the patents used generic hardware and software components to automate what was otherwise a conventional manual process of transferring data from one device to another. The district court in the case went farther than that, though. It awarded the defendants their attorney's fees for an exceptional case. The court found that Selspin had been overly aggressive in litigating its claims and could have filed a test case instead of filing the dozen or more cases all at once. In response, Selspin argued that it did not have to file a test case because its patents were presumptively valid. And that's where the case got interesting. Now, aren't all patents presumed valid, or does the presumption not apply to validity challenges for an eligible subject matter under Section 101? That's the question. Several years ago, in 2014, Judge Mayer wrote a concurring opinion in the Ultramercial versus Hulu case, where he said that no presumption of validity should attach when assessing eligibility under Section 101. One of the reasons he gave was that the patent office had not been rigorously applying 101 for many years and instead had taken an expansionist approach not supported by the legislative history. Judge Mayer also pointed out that in the Supreme Court's recent 101 cases, it never mentioned, much less applied, any presumption of eligibility. The rest of the Federal Circuit, though, never endorsed that view in Judge Mayer's concurring opinion. Most of the patent eligibility cases coming to the Court of Appeals were decided on motions to dismiss or summary judgment as legal questions. So the presumption of validity, which carries with it the burden of proving fact by clear and convincing evidence, likely didn't come into play. It wouldn't affect the outcome either way. Understandably, the district courts weren't sure what to do. Mostly, they avoided the question, and the Federal Circuit didn't answer it directly for five years. In the Berkheimer case, the court said that patent eligibility under 101 is a legal question, but there may be underlying questions of fact, such as whether a claim element or a combination of elements is well understood, routine, and conventional. And any fact that is pertinent to invalidity, such as those in the 101 inquiry, must be proven by clear and convincing evidence. The court cited the Supreme Court's decision 
and Microsoft versus I4I. But the Federal Circuit had never said directly that the presumption of validity applies to Section 101 until now. How did the district court in Selspin deal with the presumption of validity? The district court went with Judge Mayer's concurring opinion. Remember, in awarding attorney's fees, the court suggested that Selspin should have litigated a test case rather than filing all the suits at once. And Selspin argued in response that its patents were presumptively valid. The district court said no. Selspin's patents were not presumptively eligible under Section 101, citing Judge Mayer's concurring opinion. Mike, how did the Federal Circuit answer the question of whether the presumption applies to the eligibility under Section 101? A three-judge panel of the Federal Circuit, Judges Lurie, O'Malley, and Toronto, in an opinion written by Judge O'Malley, said no, Judge Mayer was wrong. The presumption of validity applies to patent eligibility challenges under Section 101. Interestingly, the Federal Circuit's holding came up in the discussion of attorney's fees. The court first vacated the district court's order dismissing the cases, although the Federal Circuit found that the claims were directed to an abstract idea, namely the idea of capturing and transmitting data from one device to another. It also found that there were factual disputes about whether the claims recited an inventive concept. Selspin had made specific, plausible, factual allegations in its complaints that the claimed inventions were not conventional, which the district court should have accepted as true. For example, the claims recited a two-step, two-device structure requiring a connection before the data was transmitted which Salspin alleged was not conventional. The Federal Circuit then reiterated that patents issued by the Patent Office are presumptively valid. Citing Microsoft versus I4I and Berkheimer, the court said that to the extent the district court concluded that issued patents are not presumed patent eligible, quote, it was wrong to do so, close quote. And what impact, if any, will the Salspin decision have? So while uh, Selspin arguably sets a higher bar for motions to dismiss for ineligibility under 101, its impact may not be immediately noticeable. And the reason is that Berkheimer already reset the bar. Before Berkheimer, which was decided in February 2018, motions to dismiss under 101 were granted about 70% of the time according to statistics compiled by RPX. In the year and a half after Berkheimer, that number dropped to about 45%. It may not drop much lower after Selspin. I should note that a petition for certiorari in Berkheimer is still pending in the Supreme Court. The court asked the Solicitor General to file a brief expressing the views of the United States back in January, but no brief has been filed yet. Now, Mike, the Federal Circuit answered another open question recently in Celgene versus Peter. What was the open question in that case? The Supreme Court in oil states left open the question of retroactive application of inter-party review to patents that had already issued when the law was enacted. The American Vents Act, or AIA, was enacted into law in September 2011 and its inter-party review provisions became effective a year later, in September 2012. In oil states, which was decided last year in 2018, the Supreme Court upheld IPRs in the face of a constitutional challenge that the procedure violated Article Three and the Seventh Amendment. Then, at the end of the Supreme Court's opinion in oil states, it noted that the petitioner had not challenged retroactive application of inter-party review. The Supreme Court said, quote, our decision should not be misconstrued as suggesting that patents are not property for purposes of the due process clause or the takings clause, close quote. That's more than a suggestion. It was an open invitation for someone to challenge the constitutionality of inter-party review of pre-AIA patents. And they did. Multiple appeals by patent owners who lost their patents in IPRs challenged the constitutionality of the procedure. 
The specific question was whether retroactive application of IPRs to pre-AIA patents is an unconstitutional taking of private property under the Takings Clause of the Fifth Amendment. The first case to answer that question was Celgene versus Peter. What was the Celgene case about? Celgene was an appeal from the Patent Trial and Appeal Board from an IPR proceeding. At issue were two of Celgene's patents on methods for safely distributing hazardous drugs, such as thalidomide, that may cause birth defects during pregnancy, but these drugs still have therapeutic uses. The board found the claims of both patents to be unpatentable for obviousness, and Celgene appealed. On the merits, the Federal Circuit upheld the board's decision on obviousness. It then went on to address the constitutionality of retroactive application of IPRs to pre-AIA patents. That was the question specifically left open in oil states. What did the Federal Circuit decide on the constitutional challenge in Celgene? The court upheld IPRs as applied to pre-AIA patents, saying that the procedure was not an unconstitutional taking of property without just compensation in violation of the Fifth Amendment. Essentially, the court said that similar procedures already existed in the patent office to revoke previously granted patent rights, so IPRs were nothing new in that respect. Celgene had argued that IPRs, which did not exist when its patents issued, unfairly interfered with its investment-backed expectations without just compensation. But the Federal Circuit said that the Patent Office has had the authority to reconsider and cancel patents for nearly four decades, starting with ex parte reexaminations, which were created in 1980. Ex parte reexamination that survived similar constitutional challenges and Patlex versus Mossinghoff in 1985, and Joy Technologies versus Manbeck in 1992. Similarly, inter-party re-examination, which was created in 1999, was also available when Celgene filed its patent applications. So, Celgene's pre-AIA patents were already granted subject to existing administrative procedures for reconsidering their validity and canceling them. It was enough for the Federal Circuit to decide that IPRs were not that different from the Patent Office procedures available when Celgene's patents were issued. As the Court noted, while the procedures may be different, IPRs serve essentially the same purpose as their reexamination predecessors. But the procedural differences were not enough to disrupt the expectations patent owners have had for nearly four decades, namely that patents are open to reconsideration and possible cancellation by the Patent Office. And as a result, retroactive application of inter-party review to pre-AIA patents was not an unconstitutional taking of Celgene's patents without just compensation. And Mike, what's next after Celgene on the constitutional question of retroactive application of inter-party review? After oil states, a significant number of other patent owners raised the same constitutional challenge to IPRs. Most of those appeals are still pending. The court decided Celgene first, even though the constitutional issue wasn't raised before the board. It did that in part because the court didn't want to have to wait for another case where the retroactivity challenge had been raised. And besides, as the court noted, deciding constitutionality of statutes enacted by Congress is generally thought to be beyond the jurisdiction of administrative agencies like the Patent Office. So there was no reason to wait. And the Federal Circuit didn't wait long itself in applying Celgene in another appeal. A week later, in Calabo Innovations versus Sony, the court rejected the same retroactivity challenge, citing Celgene as having already decided the issue. And the following week, in Enzo Life Sciences versus Becton Dickinson, the court said the same thing. I assume that the other pending appeals raising this issue will be handled the same way. The time for filing a petition for rehearing in Celgene hasn't run yet. It's possible maybe even likely that Celgene will file a petition for rehearing and bank 
as a prelude to seeking Supreme Court review. Some of the other patent owners who have pending appeals raising the same issue may file amicus briefs, but there are eight Federal Circuit judges who have already weighed in on the question, and Celgene, Calabo, Enzo, so I don't expect a different outcome in the Federal Circuit on rehearing. Then it will be on to the Supreme Court again. If Celgene doesn't lead the charge in the Supreme Court, then one of the other appellants likely will. So in other words, the previously unanswered question on whether retroactive application of IPRs is constitutional has been answered, at least for now. Our guest has been Mike Jakes, a partner at Finnegan, one of the largest IP law firms in the world. For more commentary on intellectual property news and issues, to listen to other podcasts, and to receive additional information on the firm, please visit www.finnegan.com. Thank you for listening to this podcast from Finnegan.